go live and uh, you can start in three, two, one. Hello, hello, hello. Today is May 2nd, 2021. And this is my first live stream on YouTube. More than 75% of my viewers are from India. And the situation in India at this moment is extremely sad. It is horrible because of the explosion of COVID-19. The suffering for most of you must be enormous. I cannot even imagine what it must be like. You may lose friends. You may lose loved ones. Keep in mind though, this will pass, although it may take a while. My heart and my thoughts will be with you and I will be your friends. I hope that may help a little bit. This live stream was organized and suggested by my close friend, Ayush Agarwal, who is an Indian himself. Ayus was instrumental to invite me to India in 2014 to give eight lectures at eight different universities. And I gave my lecture at his university, Bitspilani in Goa, on Pi Day in 2014. He became a friend ever since. I bought this kurta when I was in Goa. Goa. Ayush got his bachelor's degree at Bits Pilani. Then he went to Sweden. He was selected, which was a very tough selection, where he got his master's in science at the Royal Institute of Technology. Then he was again selected to get his doctor's degree at the Paul Scherer Institute in Switzerland. That's where he is now. Ayus has been my guest, my wife's guest, and my guest here in the United States. And I'm looking forward, Ayus, to seeing you here again. Maybe I can no longer use you, Ayus, then. Maybe I have to call you Dr. Agarwal. Ayus told me that he received 1,000 questions. He made a selection of about 50, and I made a selection of about 37. I'm not even sure whether we can do all 37, but we'll see. The person who is in charge is the person to whom I'm turning over this meeting, which is Ayus. Thank you, Walter, for this lovely introduction. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for agreeing for this live stream and a hearty congratulations on hitting 1 million YouTube subscribers. Secondly, I would like to wish a very happy birthday to your daughter, whose birthday happens to be today. 61st birthday. <laughs> wow. So just before we get into the session, for our viewers, I would like to tell you that 
Uh, this session will last anywhere between 40 to 45 minutes. That's what we are aiming for. And uh, Walter will be answering your questions. And uh, yes, so without further ado, the floor is yours, Walter. So here comes your first question. Are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. Okay. This is a question from Sharia, I hope I pronounced that correctly, in India. Why is physics so special for you? Why did you choose it? Why not chemistry or math? You're going to be very disappointed with my answer. My choice for physics was a negative choice. I was quite good in high school in math, in physics, and in chemistry. I can think of myself, do math for the rest of my life. The problem that I had with chemistry is that I had to remember so many things and I have a bad memory. Physics is more conceptual than remembering things. So my choice to go for physics was a purely negative choice. Little did I know then that I was born for physics and that physics was made for me. Next question. For sure. Why did you choose nuclear physics as your PhD topic? What made you shift to X-ray astronomy? A question by Pranvid Rawat from India. In 1955, I was very fascinated with nuclear physics. If I had to choose a PhD topic today, for sure it wouldn't be nuclear physics, but it was that choice at the time. My supervisor, Aldous Wapstra wrote a letter to the university in Chicago and to MIT, which said, look, Walter Lewin is going to get his PhD in nuclear physics. He may have said Walter is one of my best students, but I don't want to know that. And I recommend that you hire him for a year or maybe even two years. Both institutions immediately said yes. At MIT, it was Professor Bruno Rossi, who was one of the introducers, one of the inventors of X-ray astronomy. X-ray astronomy had been discovered in 1962, a whole new field. I was so immensely lucky that I chose MIT because I became a part of the pioneering time in X-ray astronomy. That was an immensely lucky shot. 430 of my 450 yeah, publications 430 of my 450 publications are all about X-ray astronomy, black holes, neutron stars, and X-ray bursts. Next question. What is the most satisfying point in your career 
as a professor? Well, there are several. Let me go in sequence. I really believe that I am one of the pioneers in e-learning. Already in 1978, 79, 80, I was on MIT's closed circuit TV 24 hours a day, and it started every hour on the hour. I helped the students in the fall with 801, Newtonian mechanics, and in the spring with 802, electricity and magnetism. Those help sessions were extremely popular. Even senior students who didn't take the course would watch my help sessions. The University in Washington, in Seattle, had its own TV station, but they didn't know how to fill it. So they asked me, could they put my help sessions and my lectures at MIT on TV in Seattle? I agreed. So my lectures were shown in Seattle. Bill Gates wrote me that he watched many of them several times. And he wrote me a very nice letter how important those lectures were in his life. Now we are at 1995. I remember I once was at Seattle at the airport. <laughs> I looked at the TV and I saw myself talking physics at the airport in Seattle. In 2002, my Edo One lectures went online with open courseware of MIT. And later, 802, and later in 2005, also my 803 lectures. I believe those were perhaps among my most important contributions of my whole career. However, as far as my research accomplishments is concerned, yes, I was a pioneer in X-ray astronomy. I made some very important discoveries with my graduate students and with my postdocs. Largely about neutron stars, X-ray binaries, and X-ray birth sources. Those will be my legacy as far as research is concerned. But my real legacy, my real legacy, maybe my lectures. Time will tell. Next question. Tell us about how you were when you were young and how you formed relationship with physics, your journey and challenges faced. Ah, I'm glad you asked that question because the answer is this. It's all in there. The book, For the Love of Physics, with my co-author, Warren Goldstein. Now, you can do one of two things. You can ask me in YouTube to send me the PDF. Cost you nothing. The only thing that the PDF does not have is the, the colored index, the colored pictures index. Here you see some colored pictures. They are not in the PDF, but it's free. 
and we have a nice saying in the United States, you can't look, you can't look a gift horse in the mouth. Alternatively, you can buy it at Amazon, also in India, for only $7. If you're very rich, you can buy one from me. And I sell it to you with zero profit for me. I stress that, zero profit. But you have to pay for the postage, which is already $40 to India. There are other legal problems that I have in the United States. If you sell me money in my PayPal account, I have to pay tax over that. The net result is that if I sell you a book, you live in the United States, you're lucky. I think it will only cost you $40. If you live in India, $65, which is absurd. Don't do it if you live in India. Settle for the PDF file. Next question. For sure. Oh, by the way, I want to show you something. I told you that I was at MIT online 24 hours per day, every hour on the hour. Students sold t-shirts and you can see on the third line of the t-shirt, 24 hours, 24 hours per day to watch Walter Lewin on MIT cable. Can you see it? Okay, next question. Will you write another book? The answer is no. Next question. By the way, I've written four books, three on X-ray astronomy and one with Warren Goldstein, for the love of physics. I will not write another book. Next question. What made you fall in love with physics? Oh my God. Have you ever thought of it? Everything around you is physics. Without physics, without electricity, your heart could not beat. You could not speak. You could not hear. You could not see. You could not walk. Without electricity, you couldn't even think. Now realize that there are exceptions of people that even with electricity, they can't think, but that's a detail. Without electricity, there are no cars, no phones, no radio, no electric lights, no TV, no GPS, no laptops, no iPhones, no internet, no YouTube, no live stream with Walter Lewin. Because of physics, we know that our universe is about 13.8 billion years old. Our sun is 5 billion years old, and the Earth is 4.5 billion years old. We know that the sun, 5 billion years from now, will have burned up all its hydrogen, will go to a helium cycle, it will then become 100 times larger than it is now. It becomes a giant. It will be the end of the Earth. The Earth will melt away. Because of physics, we know that there are about 100 billion stars in our own galaxy. 
and there are more than 100 billion galaxies in our universe. So you can make a very simple back on the envelope calculation that there must be about 10 to the 23 planets in our universe. 10 to the 23, we're only one. How much life will there be in the universe on those planets? All of chemistry is physics. Yes, you chemists, you might as well admit that. All of chemistry is physics. There is one other aspect about physics. When I asked my father, my mother, my aunt, my grandparents, my sister, how long does it take when I drop an object from here to the ground? And at what speed will it reach the ground? That will be an unimaginably difficult problem for them. I know that many of you think that physics makes simple things difficult. Oh no, it's exactly the other way around. Physics makes difficult things simple. If my grandparents or my parents or my sister or my aunts take this much physics, the question how long it would take for an object to hit the ground would be utterly trivial because physics makes difficult things simple. Next question. How does your understanding of art affect your thinking of physics? Sahil sent that question from India. Um, that can be easily answered. Pioneering physics is a new way of seeing. Pioneering art is a new way of seeing. Read my chapter 15 of this book, if you haven't seen it yet. I discussed that in great detail there. Next question. Why do you think your lectures are so famous even after 20 years? I use Mohan. Well, I use, you should be able to answer that question because you're watching my lectures. Next question. I understand why you are so popular, Professor. My question is, why is it that you are so popular in India particularly? And this is written by a countryman of mine, Walter Kuvermans, nice Netherlands Nederland, 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 now. Yeah, that is an interesting question. Why so popular in India? Well, India has 1.3 billion people and it has access, access to internet. China has 1.3 billion people, but that does not have openly access to internet. India is also at a stage in its evolution that it's hungry for knowledge. I think that's the reason why my lectures are so popular in India. But Walter, oh, by the way, your name is Walter. You know that my name, my original name in the Netherlands was Wout, because my father's name was Walter, and that became so confusing. So my grandmother told my mother, call him Wout. So I was always Wout. But when I went to the United States, I started to call myself Walter. Yeah, Wouter, if you want more information on this, send a message on YouTube or my YouTube channel and ask my Indian viewers. 75% of them are Indians. Why so popular in India? Next question.
Why are you so much fascinated by India? That's a very good question. It comes from Yosh Krishna, Krishna theory. Merut. It's not so easy for me to answer that question. India became independent in 1947. August 15. It is still struggling with growing up to become really independent. This is not meant to be an insult at all, on the contrary. We all have to grow up. And India is going through this. And you can see that in many ways. I have been four times in India. I've seen shanties. I've seen poverty. I've seen rich people. I know the education system is far from ideal. No insults implied, but how many Nobel Prizes are given to Indians? The priority in Indians is a different priority than what we have here in the West. Huge amounts of money are being poured here in education. We have super schools like Harvard, Columbia, Berkeley, MIT, Oxford in England. Huge amounts of money are being poured in that. Clearly, India cannot afford that. The same is true for Olympics. Enormous amounts of money here are poured into preparation for Olympics. How many medals, Olympic medals, did go to India? India is growing up, is wrestling in many ways. That fascinates me. And I follow that closely. And I am just so lucky that at about roughly 750,000 of my million subscribers are from India. I've been in Mumbai, Ahmedabad, Calcutta, which was, which is now called Kolkata, many times in Delhi, I was in Madras. It's a fascinating country. Next question. When will you visit India again? I won't. My doctors will not allow me. And even if my doctors were to allow me, my wife would not allow me. It's a matter of health. I'm old. And it's extremely exhausting. Even 14 hour flights, I'm not looking forward to. In addition, my doctors won't allow me. They told me that it is partly due, certainly Delhi, for the terrible pollution situation. It would be bad for my health. So, my heart is in India part of the time. My thoughts are in India parts of the time. Most of my friends are in India all the time. But I'm not going to come back to India. Next question. So during these times of COVID-19, how are you spending your days? I do physics. On average, it takes me about five hours every day 
including weekends, to keep my YouTube channel going. I have to think about problems. That's not easy. I always try to think of problems a little bit out of the box. Solutions. I have to record them. I sometimes have to record them three times before I'm happy. I often have sleepless nights because I can't quite find the right problem. All that is extremely time consuming. It basically takes all my time. Even when I work in my own garden, I'm thinking about my next step on YouTube. COVID-19 has nothing to do with that. Before COVID-19, it was the same way. After I retired from MIT in 2009, I started to concentrate on teaching the world. Now, of course, MIT Open Courseware had my lectures. Now they're on my YouTube channel. When my lectures were on open courseware, I only had a million views per year. I now have 25 million views per year. A lot of you have asked me to join another platform in India. I will not mention the name because that would not be fair. I can't afford that. I don't have the time for that. My own YouTube channel keeps me effectively occupied. I exaggerate a little bit, day and night. Thank you for your question, Shupam Kelkar. Next question. Hello, sir. I want to ask that you have been working endlessly since many years for students. What gives you that endless energy and motivation to work daily? Question for Mayhil Pahuja. Mayhul, physics is my life. I cannot not teach physics. Like an artist, an artist cannot not make arts. Does that make you question? Does that answer your question? Next question, please. Question from Gaurav Bardwaya. Excuse me for my pronunciations. Sir, can you share any of your past experience of some hilarious, interesting questions asked from one of your students and how you responded to that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, <I> can. <laughs> one student asked me once in class, are there living creatures on the moon? And I said, yes. And we call them lunatics. Next question. Question from Amog Nagara, India. Please tell any funny incident which happened at MIT. Once during my lecture, it was not one that was videotaped. It was a different term. The light went off all of a sudden. And then the light went on. Four naked women walked through my lectures all the way from the back to the front and left to the front door. Very funny. Next question. Is ability to teach a skill or a gift? It's both. It's more than that. It requires imagination. You have to think out of the box. You should never bore your students. You always have to keep them on the edge of their seats.
I do demonstrations which sometimes look dangerous. And they worry. Make them smile. I can make my students smile. I can make them laugh. I can make them cry. I can even make them wet their pants. It all comes down to preparation. To think out of the box and to show them their own world. Rainbows, blue skies, why are the clouds white? What counts is not what you cover. What counts is what you uncover. My fascination, my love with physics, I radiate and that's contagious. Many of you may know that each of my 94 course lectures at MIT, the three courses, 801, 802, and 803, each of those lectures, preparation time was between 60 to 80 hours. Preparation and imagination is one of the key ingredients. I dry run every lecture three times. Two weeks before the lecture, one week before the lecture, empty classroom. I did everything. I imagined there were people. I even included the time that it took me to walk to the light switches and turn them on and off because my lecture was only 50 minutes. And if you go 52 minutes, students leave because they have to go to another lecture. All that I did for an empty class. And then on the day of the lecture, I gave that same lecture again for an empty class at 6 a.m. in the morning. And then at 10 o'clock and at 11 o'clock, I gave the same lecture. 801, I gave 10 to 11, 11 to 12, the same 802. So, skill or gift? It's both, but it's more. Next question. Bruce from Australia, have you ever gone to bed with a physics problem woken up with a solution? What do you mean ever? <laughs> that happens to me so often. What is worse of all, that it keeps me, uh, it keeps me awake because your brains keep, my brains keep me up. If I dealt with a problem that day, that I couldn't quite do. I couldn't really lay the egg, the golden egg, the way I wanted to lay that egg. Solution was too complicated, too difficult, not clean. And yes, it happened that at two or three o'clock at night, I would get up and quickly make a note because I knew then how to do it. But the answer is yes. Kept me awake. Not occasionally. Very often, Bruce. Next question. My favorite food. Fish. Shellfish. I take my diet quite seriously. It's a matter of health. I 
I weigh only 172 American pounds. One pound is 450 grams. So do your own homework. How do I keep my weight so low? Because I eat no fat food. I'm very strict about how many calories I eat every day. No more than 1500 calories, kilocalories. Never meat. Apart from the fact that meat is unhealthy, there is another more important problem with meat. To get one pound of meat, the poor animal has to eat at least 100 to 200 pounds of food. In this world, that food should go to people. Fish is great. I love it. Next question. How did you discover the dolly line trick? I didn't discover that. My high school teacher, I still remember his name, Wassermann. He did it all the time. And it was easy. Once you see anyone do it, it's very easy to copy it. That has almost become an icon for me, my dotted lines. People think that I use at MIT special chalk. On the contrary, the thick chalk that I use at MIT, it's very difficult to make dotted lines with thick chalk. By regular chalk that any school has with blackboards, the thin chalk is way easier. Of course, on my uh, YouTube channel, I have at least one video where I explain exactly how I do it. I have, when I was in India, I have taught at least 50, maybe 100 students how to make dotted lines. The problem, of course, is you must have a blackboard. So really the credit should go to my math teacher in high school, Mr. Wasserman. Next question. I hope, sir, you, I hope you well. Thank you for doing this live. Which field of physics do you think will be the most explored in the 21st century? What discoveries and contributions could be made in that field in the next 80 years? Question from Greece, Spiros Liquidis. Well, I think you're going to see a lot new developments in gravitational waves. They have been discovered a few years ago with LIGO. One of the discoverers, a close friend of mine, Ray Weiss, he was also a professor at MIT. He shared the Nobel Prize for that a few years ago. They discovered very massive close binaries of black holes, 30, 40, 50 solar mass, which we didn't think before that couldn't even exist. They were discovered with LIGO. I expect a lot more of that in the next four or five decades. It's a new field of astronomy. Now, other areas in physics, which undoubtedly will make enormous progress in the next 80 years, are about dark matter and dark energy. Did you know that only 5% of the total energy in our universe is due to the matter that you and I know, the matter that stars are made of, the matter that you and I are made of? Only 
27% is dark matter. And we don't know what it is. It cannot be seen in electromagnetic radiation. It can only be seen because of its effect on gravity. We don't know what it is. Sixty-eight percent is dark energy. We have no clue either what dark energy is. For those of you who are ambitious, there are some Nobel Prizes waiting for you. Dark matter, dark energy. Next question. <laughs> question from Tanmoy in India. How do you use to deal with failure in your life? You know the saying, what doesn't kill you make you stronger? Yeah, I had personal failures. My high school girlfriend, it's a disaster. But it made me stronger. It made me go in a new direction, which was a better direction for me. I never made any major failures in physics. Lucky, <laughs> probably a lucky shot. Um, I failed in very other ways with relationships with people. I'm not an easy person to live with. I'm very demanding, also for myself, but also for others. That's not always easy. I failed bitterly at the stock market. I lost a fortune. Yeah, I always came out stronger. Next question. So this will be your second last question, Walter, for this session. Okay. What are you, what are your life lessons? Mani's India. My life lessons are always broaden your horizon as much as possible within the reference frame of your life. Never stop. Always get educated. Education always adds. It never subtracts. Next question, last question. So if you were not a physics researcher, researcher, then what else would you have been, Anush Belukur Kar? <laughs> if I were not a physics researcher, you could as well have asked me if I if I were not a man. Let me answer that one. It's a similar question, because I'm not a man. Because I am a man. If I were not a man, I would be a woman. And I would marry a physicist. Have a nice day and take care. And we'll be friends. So thank you everyone for joining and uh, we will be doing such live sessions in future. And if you're not yet subscribed to the channel, please do it. And yes, as Walter said, we will be friends. See you. Thank you, Arush. <laughs>